Okay, hang on a sec. Uh, I've just got to find something that I don't have and I'm feeling a bit concerned about. in my office that I was sure I had in my pocket. Does anyone here have a Mac VGA DVI converter? No, I have one. I just didn't bring it. It's an adapter that goes from one standard to another. Oh, you've got one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't believe I left that in my office. Thank heavens for David. Um, That converts the DVI standard, which is what my Mac spits out, into the plug for the SVGA. Okay, shh, shh, shh. let's start, guys. Now. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry that took me so long find that, sudden panic, not having that. But let's resume the lecture now. Someone asked a good question in the break, but just before we do that, I did want to show you, did someone say click on discuss? I think it was, it was work, got working again this morning. It went down over the weekend, but it's working again now. Um, you can't see it? Oh, you can't see it. <laughs> so yeah, the forum's back up, but it did go down over the weekend. Yep. Well, it did for me. You might have, you might have been okay. Uh, let's go to the schedule. Let's log in. Shh, 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 shh. Someone did find an extreme ironing clip. And that was so awesome. And then I, I browsed around and found some related ones, and I've actually put one in. So I, I haven't put in the one that the, the person put in. Uh, I put in my own one. Here's this. Look. But I got it from finding there. So thank you very much. It was William. Who's William? Wherever William is. Thank you for posting that. Here's the extreme ironing clip I saw. <laughs> Sorry, it's very beautiful music. Um, <laughs> so that's completely awesome, and it's very, very funny. And the one William posted is some people doing ironing underwater, and there's people that do ironing out of parachutes. It's just awesomely good. Um, all right, so look, we talked about standards, and you might have noticed the, the, the relevance to us in computing of standards is they are what's going to make programming in the large work. Here's how it's going to work. 
Whenever we have a group of people who are going to be working on a problem, and it doesn't matter how big that problem is, before we start, we're going to agree on a standard. And it's not going to be a book, because we hate reading. It's going to be a very, very, very small thing. And we're going to say, your code has to provide this stuff. And your code can rely on this stuff. That's the standard. And the standard, when we write a standard in programming, we're going to call it an interface. Okay, so this is designing an interface. Now, we've sort of eased you into it a little bit. Think about task two. Can anyone see where a standard and an interface might be hiding in task two? Hang on. The header, yeah. Uh, Sudoku grid is .c is a file that has to provide a whole lot of functionality. And main uses the functions it defines and relies on that functionality. And in theory, one person could write the main and another person could write Sudoku grid.c. Do you see that? And if it worked fine, you'd be able to plug them together and it would work. So I've written a main and it's available to you guys. If you wrote your Sudoku grid.c and compiled it with my main, it should work and you should just get a Sudoku solver. That is a miracle. How come that should work? Because we're both complying with the same standard. Where's that standard set out? In the header file, Sudoku grid.h. So that's why I import Sudoku, hash include Sudoku grid.h in main, and you hash include it in Sudoku grid.c, and we're both sharing the same standard. And you have to write those functions, and I have to use those functions. Does that make sense? When we get this thing set up right, if we get the standard set up and we actually have the people using the interface perfectly, then the type that we've built is called an abstract type. Now, Sudoku grid is not an abstract type. So what is Sudoku grid? What is a Sudoku grid? In the assignment, what is Sudoku grid? What's that? It's a type def for what? An array of how many characters? It's an array of 81 characters. So whenever I say in the assignment, whenever in the assignment I talk about something called a Sudoku grid, that's a type, whenever you've got something of that type, we know what it is. Do you agree? It's an array of 81 characters. That means if we know what that type is, it's concrete. It's known. If we were going to get this interface thing working perfectly, we'd actually want that type to be abstract. And this, in our first cut of programming the large, is how we're going to introduce interfaces and standards and get to programming the large. We're going to define some types at various times. And when we define a type, we're going to not actually say what the type is. We're just going to give you a standard for that type. And that standard will be a .h file for that type. And you will implement that type in a .c file. And you will use that type in your main and other places. And if the person using the type has no idea how the type has been written, only knows what the interface functions are, then we're going to say that's an abstract type. And we're going to call that an ADT. And that's what we're going to be talking about next week, ADTs. ADTs are abstract data types. What they are is they're types which are specified by an interface. And the interface tells you all you need to know about the type. And in particular, it doesn't tell you what the type is. It just tells you how you use it. So, in terms of what we were talking about functions and intentionality and extensionality, do you remember that? What's an ADT? It's an extensional specification. What an ADT is, is it's something that tells you the properties of the type and how you interact with the type and what the type appears to be like, but we never go into the details of what the type actually is. If we tell you what the type actually is, it's a concrete type. Now, what's the advantage of that? And why are we going to spend a long time talking about that? Because we are. And notice this has got nothing to do with C. This is a programming idea. You can have this idea in any programming language. It's not a C idea. 
And if you search abstract data types on Google, you'll find like a billion hits because it's a very common idea that got very popular a long time ago. Before we had object-oriented programming, the best we could do were abstract types. And in fact, abstract types led us to object-oriented programming. So, hey, what's all that noise at the back? Shh, 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 shh. Um, now, when the guy showed me the miracle the first time, he showed me the miracle, the New Zealand chappy, Bob, as I like to call him, he didn't have a CD, because these were the days before CDs. What did he have? He didn't have a floppy disk. He had a little like audio cassette. Do you, do you guys know what audio cassettes are? It's a little box. This question, the little box is like this with two little holes and spindles and a little tape that goes across like that. He had a, he had a tape and he was talking about it. And he was saying, to use a tape, to make a tape player, you just need to know the dimensions of the tape and how the data is encoded on the magnetic strip and where to put those two wheels to make the tape advance and what speed to make them advance at. And if you know that, you know all there is to know. And years later, I saw an amazing device. And I, I hunted for it this morning. I put it aside and my wife keeps saying, throw that out, that's a piece of junk. And I'm saying, no, I'm going to use that to explain ADTs. And then today, the one chance I had to use it, I couldn't find it. So that's, uh, sorry about that, but I'm going to draw a picture of it. It's very exciting. It looks like this. It's a, like a black box with a little silver di a little panel there and a wire coming out of it. And the box is about the same size. Well, it is the same size as a tape. Do you know what this doobly is? Has anyone seen one of these? Yeah, what is it? Plug it into your like, iPod or your Walkman or something. Stick it in a tape slot and it puts the encoded data in the format of the tape. Thank you. If I make a little... Uh, plug here, a uh, little uh, phono plug. I could plug that into my little, have you guys heard of these things? I pooed. <laughs> you can plug a phono socket into your iPod, you can play music through your iPod, and you want to hear it in your car. But your car is an old bomby car, and it doesn't have an iPod plug. It doesn't have a CD player. All it has is a crappy little tape player. So what you do is you plug your, this little tapey bit into the iPod. And this looks exactly like a tape. It's got wheels in the right spot. It's got the same dimensions as a tape. And where the tape would have a little bit of um, magnetic tape passing over your read-write heads, this just has a little read-write head, playback head. And you stick this in your tape player and it sends magnetic signals through the head here that simulate a tape passing by. Does that make sense? And your tape player thinks it's looking at a tape. And it, play, it thinks it's playing a tape. And if it was really cool, I've never seen one that does this, it should be that you can hit the fast forward button and that sends some sort of signal to your iPod saying fast forward. I mean, you could detect the, wheels, the speed these wheels were spinning at and you could get fast forward and rewind on your iPod from this. But anyway, so the idea is, this little device here, this adapter, is made with the same physical dimensions as a tape. In fact, what it is, is someone very cleverly noticed you could exactly meet the specifications for a tape and you didn't actually have to have a tape. You could make, the specifications were just about the size of the box and the magnetic signals that had to be present at this spot and the location of the two wheels. So if you made something else that had no tape inside it, but was able to deliver magnetic signals to this spot and fit it in the tape player, as far as the tape player was concerned, it was complying with the spec. And this will plug into every tape player. Can you see that? This is abstraction. Abstraction is we don't physically care whether we get a tape or not. We just want something that meets the spec. Now maybe you could invent something that met the spec for a CD, that wasn't a CD. I don't know how you could, but maybe you could. All CD players would have to play this thing. Does that make sense? They won't care whether it's a CD or not. If you could make a super cooled form of chocolate and stick it in the CD player and exactly complied with all the specs, then it would play the super cooled chocolate. In fact, some people have business cards 
that you can stick in and play on CD players. I don't know if they comply with the specs. I don't know. I would be nervous to put one in. But if they did comply with the spec, you can put this business card in. Has anyone seen this? You can put a little business card in a CD player and it'll play the business card. Because the corners just are the right size to fit in that smaller disc for small CDs. Don't know exactly the details. So this is where we get abstraction. The idea of abstraction is if you comply with the spec, that's all we care about. We don't care what's actually under the hood. We just care if you comply with the spec. So going back to the car, I said you can step in any car in the world. I don't actually know the car's got an engine. The car might have a pygmy inside it. <laughs> and maybe when I push the go fast button, it sticks a needle into the pygmy and he runs faster. <laughs> and maybe the go slow button is some sort of head pummeling thing that <laughs> slows the pygmy down. It's very cruel. And the steering thing is some sort of scary picture that flashes up on this side and makes the pygmy run that way. <laughs> you see, you could completely replace what's under the hood. And as long as it's still complied with the interface, which is the two pedals and the steering wheel, as far as you're concerned, it's still a car. It's still an engine. Still, does everyone get that? This is abstraction. So the idea of abstraction is we're going to be, remember I said a couple of weeks ago, the trick with programming isn't to concentrate so much on the algorithms. It's to get the data right, to have more complex data. Move your complexity out of your algorithms into your data. You'll have simpler code. You'll have more complex structures of data. And you're seeing now in this last assignment, Sudoku grids a slightly more complex piece of data because it's 81 cells and things like that. But that extra complexity lets us write simpler code. So we're going to be spending more and more time writing more and more complex data. But whenever we invent our complex data types now, I'm not, after this is task two, I'm never going to tell you again, this is how the ta data is represented. So for task two, I made it easy for you. I didn't make it abstract. I said, here are the six functions we need. And by the way, a Sudoku grid is an 81 cell array of char. But can you see the assignment would have been just as good and just the same if I'd just given you those six functions and hadn't told you what the type of Sudoku grid was? Because my main program that solves Sudoku grid never relies on it being an array. It just relies on those six functions being implemented correctly. If I'd set the assignment up that way, you would yourself, the first question you would have asked yourself is, gee, how am I going to represent a Sudoku grid? And some of you would have done 81 chars. And some of you would have done 81 ints. And some of you would have had a two-dimensional grid. And some of you would have done crazy other stuff. Which is best? Who cares? I don't care. As long as all those six functions work, my solver will work regardless of what actual type you use. But I told you what type we were using. So we're doing a concrete type. And this is my way of introducing you to abstract types. From now on, we'll be doing the same thing. I'll be giving you a header file that describes what all the functions have to do. And you will first of all think of a type to represent them. And then you will implement all those functions. And you might choose one array, and you might choose another array, and you might choose some sort of tree, and you might choose this, and you might choose an enormous int. You might code the entire thing in binary. It doesn't matter. And all of your programs will work when combined with my main, because my main just relies on those six functions working. And if we go back to Alan Turing when I was talking about extensionality, this is extensionality. All I care about is how your stuff behaves. I don't actually care what's under the hood. Does that make sense? So that's what an abstract type is. Now, we will be building our own abstract types either in Wednesday's lecture or next week. Um, now, I wanted to show some stuff. Someone asked a question in the break that was a very good question. They said, Oh, what was the question? Who was the last person speaking to me in the break that I said, that's such a good question, I want to say it again. Wave at me, quick. Oh, yeah. What was the question? The head, oh, yeah, the head of file of the testing program. Let's have a look at that. All right. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go to my laptop. And let's hope technology is going to be nice to us today. Work. Please, technology. Yes. You see, you don't even know that there's a computer in here. What could be inside here? Pygmies? It could be ants, very clever ants. And does it make any difference whether it's ants or chips? Really, no. As long as it complies with the spec. 
does the spec say your laptop has to work in a vacuum? If the spec says that, then ants wouldn't comply. But if the spec doesn't say that, then an ant-powered laptop would be absolutely compliant with the spec. Oh, yeah, you're singing all the songs. Did you like that song? Eh, it wasn't too bad. Can't play it anymore, it's gone away. Okay. Oh, yes, now we can hear it now. Now, let me start. Um, what am I looking for? I'm looking for Xcode. We're going to find our header file. Here's my main.c. Here's my solution. Here's my solution. Okay. You, you asked a question about testsudoku.h. Here's testsudokugrid.h. It defines one function. That means that your testsudokugrid.c has to do what? Has to define what? One function. That is the only function it has to supply. Can you supply other functions? Yes. yes, you can do whatever else you want, I don't care. But what are you required to do? Yes, you've got to make them static, you can't export them, that's right. But you're required, the only thing you're required to do is to make this one function. Let's look at Sudoku grid.h. What are you required to do? You're required to implement this function. You're required to implement this. Oh, no, you're not actually. We give them to you. Oh, but you should, probably should as practice to warm up and it'll help you in the testing. You're required to implement this function. You're required to implement this function. Shh, 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 shh. You're required to implement this function. You're required to implement this function. You're required to implement this function. And this is the hard one. You're required to implement that function. So for your testing, you're required to implement one function. And there is a contract going on here because I'm going to call that one function to see if it works. So I'm expecting you to supply that. That one function will no doubt cascade into lots of small functions you write yourself. But I'm not requiring, I don't need to know the names of those functions. In fact, I don't ever want to see those functions. I just want to know I can call your test function and it will either pass or fail. And I'm going to get broken Sudoku grid.cs and I'm going to call your function on those. And I want it to see test pass, pass, pass every time I put a good one in. And when I put a bad one in, I want to call that test function of yours. I want it to fail. And when, when you write your uh, Sudoku grid.c, I want you to just write all these functions that have the right behavior so I can plug your Sudoku grid.c. It's just plugging. It's unplugging. It's just like the laptop, like the PowerPoint, like uh, the CD. I can unplug your Sudoku grid.c and take your Sudoku grid.c and plug it in and everything should work. And then I could unplug your test Sudoku grid.c, put it down there, and I could get your test Sudoku grid.c and plug it in and it will all still work. And all these things can fit together and no matter what combination I try, they'll all work magically because you're all going to comply with the interface. And the interface is just what the .h files say you have to do. Does that all make sense? Now, how close was that to answering your question? I feel, uh, uh, the guy that asked the question, did that answer the question or there's still more? That did answer the question. What I'd like to do now is I thought, let's write an extra function ourselves and let's write some unit tests for it so you guys can see how to write unit tests. What do you think of that? So we're going to suppose that the assignment said shh, 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 that the interface had to include one more function. It had to include a function called um, Uh, common, common value. And the common value function has to search through the Sudoku grid and find which value occurs the most frequently in the Sudoku grid. Because often if you're solving a Sudoku grid, you might want to start with the value that's the most common. That's often what you do when you try and solve it with pen and paper. So maybe it would be useful to have a function to return which value is the most common. Now straight away we've got to think what's the possible problem we could get? What if there are two or more with the same frequency? And what are we going to say it should do? Return either of them, OK. And what's the other problem we could have related to that vaguely? It's really the same one as that, but it might look like a different case. What if there's none in the, what if there's none? And we're going to say, if there's none, what, how are we going to deal with that? If it's a completely empty grid? Return code? We could do a return code. 
But think about the last case we just dealt with, with two of equal frequency. What's that? We could return empty. I'll say empty is the most common. Yeah, return any. Yeah, because we're going to say they're all equally common. Because how common are they? They're all zero. They all have zero frequency. Wherever possible, I'd rather not give it special extra behavior, though that's a good extra behavior to give it if we were. I'd rather give it behavior that's consistent with its behavior. I'd rather not have special cases if I can avoid it. All right, so we're going to have this function. So if we're going to have a new function, is it going to be an interface function that other people can use, or is it going to be a private function that just we can use? Well, it's only going to be interesting if it's an interface function. So let's make an interface function called most common value. If it's an interface function, where does it have to live? It has to go into the header. So I'm going to add it to the interface. I'm going to say, I want a function called value, value most common value. And what does it get given, I guess? Sudoku grid called game, say, whatever you want. Now, guys. Have you noticed that Sudoku grid starts with a lowercase s? In this course, here's the convention we're going to follow. When you create your own types, if they're concrete types, we're going to start them with a lowercase letter. This is a concrete type, which you're just accepting on trust at the moment, because we haven't really seen what an abstract type looks like. But I think you understood when I said it's a concrete type because we all know how it's represented. We all know it's an array of 81. So because it's concrete, that's why it was started with a lowercase s. If it was an abstract type, we'd have defined it with an uppercase s. And it would be type def to be uppercase and everything would be uppercase. But at the moment, it's a lowercase one. Let's put a comment in saying what it does. Returns most common digit in the grid if two are, if two plus r equally common return either plus if all empty uh, so if all empty return any okay just to make it really clear all right so now we've defined what it should do now what's the next thing we're going to do we've said We've said what it should do, and we've put a stub file in the interface, so we've now added it as a requirement. It's now in the red book. That means anyone who, write, who wants to use the Sudoku grid can now rely on it being there. And it means anyone that wants to make a Sudoku grid themselves has to put it in. What do we have to do now? Write a, write a test. That's right. Now, I've been looking through diaries, and lots of people have been saying, oh, I don't know if I should write tests as I go or write tests at the end. I think I'll write them at the end. And I can understand why you're thinking that, because tests are new and you don't really know how to do it. And one person said, oh, I want to get lots of good style marks for my tests, and I'm not really sure what they should look like at the moment, so I won't write them till the end. But the tests are actually there to help you, and we want you to write tests throughout. The whole reason we have task two, I should say, just to reveal our thinking in the designing of the course, task two serves three purposes. One is it gives you a bit of practice with arrays. Two, it's an intro to abstract data types. It's a concrete type, but it looks just like an abstract type because it's got this interface and all the multiple files and the test files and it has this shape and you're all spending a lot of time thinking, oh, what the heck, how, ah, uh? because you've probably noticed this assignment, the hard thing's understanding what you've got to do. Once you understand what you've got to do, everyone's doing the assignment in one night or, you know, two days. So, like half the course has done the assignment already and most of their diaries look like this. Oh my God, I don't understand, I'm freaking out, this doesn't make any sense, but I'm going to start now because last time I left it till too late. Oh, it doesn't make any sense. 7 o'clock, still doesn't make any sense. I hate Richard. 8 o'clock, doesn't make any sense. 9 o'clock, oh, hang on. Oh, I get it. Oh, it's really easy. 10 o'clock, finished. <laughs> so the hard thing about this assignment is understanding what you've got to do. And that's, that's appropriate. We, that's what uni should be about. The hard stuff shouldn't be carrying heavy weights or spending lots of time. The hard stuff should be using your brain. But once you've understood it, it's a dry run for the project. Because when the project comes out, it's going to look a lot like this, but it won't be new to you. You'll have seen it. So reason number two is it gives you like a dry run for abstract types. And reason number three is it's a dry run for unit testing. Because from now on, we want you to do unit testing all the time. And the first time anyone does unit testing, they often don't do it right. So we want you to have one practice run at it. Doing it right means you write the tests as you go. If you're tempted to leave them till the end, the tests aren't going to help you. You're just doing them for marks. 
The tests are there to help you. Now on this assignment, because it's so easy, once you work out what you've got to do, you might think there's no much point in having tests. But get in the habit of writing tests, because it is a killer habit to be in. And then once you get the hard stuff, you're just going to be able to steam through it, because you'll be in all these good habits, and you'll just start writing tests, and everything will just work, and you'll never ever hit a really hard problem. Because the nice thing about tests is it breaks everything into lots of small, tiny problems. So the next thing to do is to write a test. So let's go to our test Sudoku grid.c. Here's my one. Right, there it is, ba 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 ba. Look, I've defined some internal test functions myself. Static. static mean, what does static mean? We did that in last lecture. Someone tell me, what does static mean? Static Means the name of this function is a secret. Yeah. So if it's cross compiled with other files, the other files can't see these functions. We want these functions to be secrets. These are internal functions that I've used in my testing. I don't want the rest of the world to see these because when you unplug my one, and plug my tester in here, and we plug in your um, Sudoku grid.c here, what if your file and your file both had the same function names? Then everything would clash and wouldn't work. So we want all our function names to be secret. It's like saying, what if when you got in the car, as well as knowing about the two pedals and the steering wheel, you, you could sort of see all the wiring and all the mess and all the internal functions in the engine and the oil, and you could see all this other stuff then when you're driving, you might be thinking about all this other stuff, and you might sort of get used to slowing the car by pulling out the ignition wire or something, because you could see the wire. And that's hopeless then, because when you go to someone else's car, they might not be having an accessible ignition wire, and you can't do it. So we don't want you to use anything outside the spec. We don't want anyone to access anything outside the spec. Everything has to be hidden. The blink function, you can have it, but no one else can use it. So static means it hides all the functions. So my test Sudoku grid includes Sudoku grid.h, of course, because they're the functions I'm about to test. I need to know their names. Then I define, I put in prototypes for all the internal functions I wrote. And then I write the one function I'm required to write. This is what was in my header, remember? And all I do is, what is how does my one function work? It makes a Sudoku grid called game one. It prints out, I'm testing Sudoku grid.c. And the other important thing to see is at the end it prints out, all passed, woohoo! They're the key lines you've got to put in. You've got to print something first saying what I'm about to do. And then when you're finished, you print something saying, yeah, it worked. And that way, if something fails, you know where it failed. Because you see the message saying, I'm about to do this. And then you, see the, you don't see the message saying it worked. And you know where it failed. If you just um, don't print out, I'm about to do this, and something fails, then you have no idea where in the code it failed. Yes? Four unit testing, that's maths. No, no, no. <laughs> um, is there like a standard as to what you print out? Like, I know you have to print out if it's test pass. In that case, you probably also pass that way. Oh, is there any standards for what you should print out? No. In this course, no. All we want to see is all tests passed at the end on a line by itself. You can print anything else you, you want out before that. Best not to hand it in printing out lots and lots of crap because it'll, it'll depress us when we mark it because we'll have to clear all the crap out. But yeah, print out whatever helps you. Yeah, yeah, whatever you want. So what? But no, it doesn't have a main function. The only function it has is test Sudoku grid. So, shh, shh, that was a good question. It doesn't have a main. I've seen you. Hang on, I'll get to you in a sec. It doesn't have a main, so how does this ever get called? Where does it get called from? Main.c. Look, here are my files on the side. Can you see them? Sudoku grid.h, Sudoku grid.c. Test Sudoku grid.h, test Sudoku grid.c. Main.c. Let's look at my main.c. Here's what main.c looks like. It's what you've seen. Include standard.io.h, include Sudoku grid.h. Hash defines the things we need. I don't know if it should be hash defining those. Weren't they in Sudoku grid dot H? Are they or not? Oh, yeah, that's no good. Oh, I've defined them twice. I didn't need them. So let's kill that, kill that. Uh, let me just comment them all out. Just temporarily, just to make sure everything still works. And true and false, do I need them? I might need them. Can you do comments like that? Oh, yeah, this is a C comment. Yes, you can if you want. There's a way of C commenting out more than one line at a time. If you do star, angle bracket, I mean stroke star, then everything's commented out till it sees a star stroke. It's normally not a really um, favoured way of writing comments, but it's a quick and easy way of commenting out large chunks of code if you want to temporarily see if things still work, if you've commented all that stuff out. It's not fantastic because it doesn't nest properly. The style guide says, does it actually literally say don't do it? No, it's 
It says discouraged. Yeah, so do it if you think it really helps, but it's generally not considered to be such good practice. Yeah. But certainly you do it while you're testing if you wanted to just remove a whole lot of code without deleting it. Because you might want to put it back in if things still work. All right, so here's my function. It hash includes Sudoku grid.h, which defines all this stuff anyway. Hash defines true and false for some reason. Can't remember why. Do I actually use them? Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Is a prototype for the function called has solution that we developed in class. And then here's my main. Now, this is the key. Everyone look at this. This is the key bit. My main re creates a Sudoku grid called sample. It reads it in using read game. It prints it out so I can see what it looks like. That's just for my own interest. And then if there's a solution, it prints out the solution. And then it returns zero, which should be exit success. But what does it do before it does any of that stuff? It runs my tests. So my tests are called, who asked the question? It was someone around here. Yeah, my tests are called from inside my main. And I leave that there. It's not that sometimes I run a test and sometimes I run the main. Whenever I run main, my tests all run first. And I run it all the time. So my tests are just always running. And I'm constantly getting that, all passed, all passed. And if I change something, I don't even care if it breaks it or not. Sometimes I don't even look to see if it's broken it. I change something and think, oh, that should do. And then I go, run, all passed. Ah, oh, it did do. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very fast, it's a very reassuring thing when you're fooling around with code that you haven't broken something that previously worked. It's not a guaranteed way of doing it, of course. You might not have good enough tests. So you might break it in a way you weren't testing. So what would happen if you found your code was incorrect, but it was passing all your tests? What should you do? What's that? Fix the code. Before you fix the code, what should you do? Yeah. If you pass all the tests and you discover your code has an error in it, the first thing you do is put a new test in that means you fail. Does that make sense? You put a new test in to catch the case that you just found. That's really important. That's good debugging. Whenever you come up with a case that leads to an error in your code, that's precious and you love it. You write down quickly, oh, but when I typed in 372, it didn't work. Because maybe that's the only case that makes it fail. Or maybe you were just lucky to find that case. You don't want to throw that case away. And then as soon as you fix your code, you want to make sure 372 now works. Well, with unit testing, you automate that. So the first thing you do is you write a test for what you think 372 should actually do. You run your code and you check that you fail the test. Then you fix your code. Then you run the test again. And now it should pass. Does that make sense? And you never move that test. That 372 test is now part of your test suite. And your test suite just gets bigger and bigger every time you add a new test. So yeah, yeah. So testSudoku.grid gets called um, at the beginning of my main. Gets called every time. So now let's write our test function for, um, uh, I can't even remember what it was called. What was it called? All right, let's call it test most common value. So I'm going to run a test on most common value. All right, uh, so I'd better put in here static void test most common value. Oh, that's not right. Thank you. And I haven't implemented the function yet, but the very first thing I'm going to do is write a test for it. Oh, well, in fact, why wasn't I a bit more lazy and just stole this line? Control, copy. And let's put in the test here. All right, so how am I going to test it? Well, I guess I'll create a Sudoku grid. Sudoku grid. What am I going to call it? Grid. Say, and it's currently, is it empty at the moment? No. no, it's not empty. Ah, now luckily I've written a function called clear game that clears the grid. And I've also written a function called test clear game that checks that that function works. And you'll notice I call test clear game first. So my clear game function works. So I, why don't we just call clear game? That was nice. So I'll just go clear game grid. There we are. So now I've got a clear grid. And now I'm going to go uh, value, value common. I'm going to say common, oop, common equals most 
common value for the grid. And what should the answer be? Should be anything except, shouldn't be empty cell. Would you agree? Yes. So assert common is less than or equal to max value. Assert common is greater than or equal to min value. All right, that's one test. Should say, let's say what I'm doing. Test uh, works for empty grid. And what do I need to put first? I should probably print something out. Print F testing most common value. What did I forgot a quote? All right, so that was a pretty boring test, wasn't it? Uh, and I should probably put in a couple more tests as well. I should probably check that if there's just one thing in there, it'll detect that one thing. I should probably test it works for a completely full board. And I should probably test that if there's the most common one, it has seven elements in it, and there's two of those, that it returns one of those two. So I need to generate some more complicated test cases in an empty board. How can I do that? Well, I, you, what if I wanted to create a full grid? What if I wanted to create Sudoku grid, full grid, a grid that's completely full? <coughs> How can I initialize it at the beginning to make it completely full? Do, have you seen an array initializers? When I create the array, I can give it an initial value? You might think you could do this. Does anyone think this would be OK? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, let me just put a string. Is that the continuation character? Is that going to work? Let's try and see if that works. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is not a legal board, but there was no requirement. It had to be a legal board. Did that work? Yeah, that works. Okay. Oh, yeah, and how can I append them together then? It automatically appends the strings together. Oh, how very neat. Do I need a line continuation character? Oh, that's very nice. Thank you, C. Um, I don't want to go to too much trouble over doing this because I'm about to say you might want to do this, but it's going to be wrong. You might think this is one neat way of creating, and what, it needs just a, a, is that it? You might think this is a way of quickly creating an array. Because it appears to be an initializer setting its initial value to the character 1, followed by the character 2, followed by the character 3, followed by the character 4, up to the character 9, followed by the character 1, da, da, da. It appears to be correct. But there is a subtle problem with this. Can anyone see what it is? And C will actually let you do this. What's the sort of problem? Yeah. How long is this string? 82 characters long. Why is this 82 characters long? Because how does C terminate a string? As far as C is concerned, a string is an array of characters. But how does C terminate a string? It puts a zero at the end, a slash zero, an ASCII, the code zero at the end. So, so oh, this, is, we, this is not an abstract time, so it's okay. Um, this is 82 characters long, this string. Now, it turns out C is actually going to forgive you for doing this. And it will try and jam this 82 character array into that 81 character array up there, and it will happily drop the last character off. It turns out, well, usually, that will work. But it's not good, is it? I don't like it. I don't like assigning a big array into a smaller array and just hoping it's going to work. So really, what we'd need to do is something like this. We really need to use a proper initializer, which is, goes like, which is such a pain. 
It's such a pain, but how many times am I going to have to do this? I'm never going to do it more than this one time because my keyboard has this feature called copy and paste. <laughs> and you could also use hash define or you could do hundreds of things. So although it's slightly annoying, there we go. What do you think of that? That doesn't look too bad. And let me put that angle brackets up there. These guys down here. Whew. That's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Now that's sticking 80, 81 characters in exactly. Does everyone get the thing about the strings? I sort of mentioned it because I wanted people to understand about strings. A string and array is a sequence of characters with an extra thing at the end saying, I've reached the end of the string. You never see the extra thing at the end because C always stops when it gets to it. That's how it knows it's reached the end of the string. But the last thing there is a zero character saying it's reached the end. So if you've got a string that looks like it's 81 characters long, it's really 82 characters long. So don't store it into an array that has only 81 spaces in it. Yes? Semicolon. Semicolon. Thank you very much. So now I've got a full grid and I could test that and so on. Does, everyone, does that make sense to everyone? Let me just quickly test the full grid. And let's go, uh, what do we call it? Full grid. Common equals, where are you? Come to me, my line. And what do we call it? Full grid or something? Just full? It, it wanted to type the rest in for me. Thank you. Um, and then I guess I'd better do the same assert. Now, I still haven't done exhaustive testing. There's still one or two more cases I've put in. But you can see with copy and paste, it'll only take a second or two to put those cases in. And I should put a little comment in here saying what I'm testing for. Test turns legal val for full grid. And now I'll just run it. Build and go. Thinking build error, failed one thing. What did I do wrong? Most common value is reference from Sudoku grid. Most common value? Couldn't find most common value. What's, what's it talking about? Can't find most common value. I forgot to write the function. <laughs> How about that? So we've defined the function. We've written a test for the function. Now just comes a tiny little detail of writing the function. Let's write that. So it was void. Here's where Mr. Cut and Paste would have helped me. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and what we need to do is uh, Sudoku grid. Grid. All right, and now I'm going to write, given a grid, I've got to find the most common value in the grid. How am I going to do that? A while loop? I could loop through the, I could, what can I do? I could, there's lots of ways of doing it. I could count how many times one appears in it, then I could count how many times two appears in it, and then I could count how many times three appears in it. I could keep track of the biggest one I've seen so far. That's one way of doing it. Or I could create an array that kept a count of how many times I've seen each one. Why don't we do that? Let's say int count um, Thank you, num values. Uh, and I can initialize it to all be zeros. Do you remember how to do that? Did did Tim show you how to do this? I'm pretty sure he did. All right, so I've got an array now full of of zero counts. And then I'm going to do while um, value is less than or uh, oh, value is a type. Thank you. Um, oh, what am I going to call it? I, no, I doesn't, I mean this here, the counter actually means something. I'm, I'm going all over all the possible values that could be in the array. Possible value. While possible value is less than or equal to, uh, the max value, I guess. I better initialize it up here. Value. 
value. Oh, we're nearly out of time. Oh, can you guys finish this yourselves, do you think? I've just noticed we're nearly out of time. Does anyone have any? I will finish this and post it as soon as I get back to my office, which will be in about two and a half hours. I will post up in the lecture notes this actual code. Any questions before you go? Yes? How evil are the tests? Not very evil. Good luck, everyone. Ask your tutor any questions. Any final questions, bring them on Wednesday. Good luck.